Okay, great. Uh, welcome, welcome all of you folks. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this keynote uh, with Dr. Sharad Kutikunda. Um, like I was saying, great to see so many familiar faces and also great to see so many new ones. Um, and welcome to all of you joining us from either within or outside of the Terra community. Uh, if you haven't if you haven't met before, my name is Ashwin, Ashwin Apte. I am the director of Terra's 12-week uh, flagship course, Climate Change Learning for Action. Uh, this talk today is the keynote uh, keynote address for the fellows in our newly launched Gorillas cohort uh, of the LFA program. And it is also an expert guest talk for the fellows in our ongoing FUSAS cohort. Um, so we have uh, fellows from two cohorts here today and also uh, people from the community. Uh, these two cohorts together represent about 300 fellows from more than 20 countries. Um, they come with a broad range of professional backgrounds, life experiences, and all of them uh, with one thing in common. All of them are looking to apply their skills to solving for climate change. Uh, the Learning for Action course, uh, just a brief overview, is an uh, intensive exploration of climate science, climate impacts, climate solutions. And it's a combination of written classes, live uh, weekly lab sessions, deep dive, uh, expert guest talks like this one, workshops, and so on and so forth. So it's, all of this is intended to help uh, fellows learn about climate change so that they can find their own role in working to address it. Uh, Terra as a company was founded in 2020. Uh, and has an ambitious goal of getting 100 million people working on climate change this decade. And we offer a new cohort of the LFA, the Learning for Action course, every six weeks. Uh, and if, if you're interested, please check us out. We just go to our website, terra.do. Um, our next incoming cohort begins on the 22nd of January. So you have maybe about a month or so to apply for that one. Uh, a quick note on today's session, uh, please stay on mute throughout uh, so we can hear our speaker clearly. Uh, and leave your cameras on if possible, as I was saying before. It's always great to uh, speak uh, to people on the screen. Uh, we uh, For today, we are only taking questions from our current fellows of the LFA. Uh, so current fellows of the Gorillas and the FUSAS cohorts. Uh, we will be using Slido, which is an online Q&A platform. Uh, fellows of the FUSAS and Gorillas cohort, uh, you will find the Slido link in a message uh, about this talk in your cohort Slack channel. So again, just go to your cohort Slack channel and you'll find a link where you can go and post messages, uh, post questions uh, for Sharad. All right, um, I'll I'll start with uh, a brief introduction of our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Sharad, I, I had the pleasure of meeting him last month. Uh, we live uh, very close to each other in Goa, coincidentally. Um, uh, he's the founder and director of urbanemissions.info or UEinfo. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, New Delhi, India, and an affiliate professor at the Desert Research Institute in Reno in the U.S., his main research interest is air quality analysis at urban, regional, and global scales, and finding ways to bridge the gap between science, policy, and public awareness. Uh, he is also the developer of the SimAir uh, family of tools capable of assessing air pollution uh, scenarios in a multi-pollutant environment. Uh, UEinfo, uh, in some Indian context, UEinfo launched India's only open air uh, quality, open air quality forecasting platform. Uh, giving out model forecasts and source contributions for the upcoming three days and other policy relevant information for all districts across India and also launched the APNA uh, city program designed to support the needs of cities long term air quality management planning. And this has applications in Asian, African and Latin American cities. Uh, in India, uh, Dr. Kutikunda and his team, they're currently supporting the National Clean Air Program uh, for 131 non attainment cities. Uh, with their air pollution information needs. Um, Sharad received his PhD from the University of Iowa in 2002, um, bachelor's in chemical engineering from the uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. And he is a NASA Earth and Space Science Fellow, a TED Fellow, and also last year's uh, recipient of AGU's International Award, uh, given annually in recognition of furthering the Earth and Space Sciences for the benefit of society in developing nations. Uh, today, he'll uh, uh, be speaking uh, to us about how local data on air pollution from monitoring and modeling studies were a key factor, not only in tackling the pollution itself, but also in driving climate policy efforts uh, in India and beyond. Uh, so welcome, Sarat, and over to you. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, I sh will share the whole screen. Uh, yes. Thank you, Ashwin, um, uh, for the almost grand introduction. And <laughs> I'll try to do justice to that. So I have a, a slide deck for about 45 minutes, and then we will take some questions right after that. Um, 
like I should mention, we are a number crunching organization and we do a lot of uh, work uh, on air quality, but it always has implications for um, for climate change. And then I'll basically build some stories uh, around that so that you have a flavor of uh, what we do for air quality and then and how we can, uh, for lack of a better word, twist that for uh, climate stories as well. Um, this is an article that I wrote in 2019 in The Wire uh, saying, okay, if we really want to, uh, just a quick question. So do you see the faces down there also or just the full screen? Yeah, uh, we don't see the faces down there. Okay, fine. Okay. So, um, so this is an article that I wrote in 2019, uh, basically, basically talking about you know, there are the three kinds of people that we really need if you really want to address uh, air pollution. I mean, I had India in mind, but it's very much applicable to all the other regions as well. Uh, the first group of people, we call them feeders. So these are the people who generate information, any kind of information that can be used for uh, our, our dialogues. The second group is uh, drummers who actually who take that information and make noise uh, so that other groups take notice of the kind of work that's happening uh, in the information generation phase. And then you have the changers. Basically, these are the people who will use the information and listen to the people from the drummers on what kind of messages that are going out. And they are the decision makers. They'll make the right decisions. So basically, if we want a good change to happen on table, we need uh, all these three people on the, on the on the table. And we need like, all of them to take action. So where does urban emission comes in? Uh, come in. So we are a full-time feeder and a part-time drummer. Uh, we, I mean, we are not an activist group, so we we basically provide a lot of information to advocacy groups, academic groups, other research groups, and also to uh, um, official bodies as well, pollution control boards in India or other um, policy relevant uh, organizations in other ministries. Uh, by virtue of being in India, we do a lot of work in India, but uh, the work extends into uh, other regions as well. So one of the big things that we do focus on is uh, sharing knowledge. And so a lot of work that we do is open. Uh, all the information that we generate is already open. And we basically make sure that if we go to a city and we start building stories for them, it's not just the political bodies or the policy bodies who have access to that. We take anybody who's interested to do some work uh, in this space in the city should have access to that information. So one of the umbrella programs is this uh, Apna City program. Uh, in Hindi, Apna, A-P-N-A actually means our, so our city program, and its full form is air pollution knowledge assessments. So for every city, we build collate as much information as we can for each of these cities, and we build stories and pass them on to the local groups. Uh, a quick example of how it worked out uh, is uh, through these simple leaflets that we build for each of the cities, which will give you a, a quick snapshot of what are the emission intensities from various sources within the city's airshed. So are they coming from residential sector, transport sector, industries? Are there any unofficial industries like brick kilns, quarries, which are looking in the airshed? And we uh, put all that together and in this simple leaflet. So this is a... Um, um, a seminar that happened in 2017 uh, uh, in Patna, in one of the cities. And the person reading the leaflet is actually uh, Bihar's deputy chief minister at the time. Uh, we put the leaflet there where he, where he was going to sit. We didn't really like, give it to him in his hand. But he, he read the leaflet and he read it for like five minutes. I was there in the front row taking some pictures. And the person next to him is a member secretary. Uh, so obviously he's asking some questions and what is this and what is that? Uh, or is there, what's written in the leaflet? But the important thing is after reading this, when he went back, he went to the dais and made a presentation for 10 minutes and he spoke as if he had PhD in the city's air quality. So I mean, that actually uh, was a start of some of the work that we did in the city. I mean, he, he obviously was interested in who made that leaflet and uh, we had some audience with him after that. We got a lot of permissions because of that to do surveys in the city. Uh, this is the uh, in-use vehicle fleet survey that we did uh, using 19 students. Uh, we are proud to say that of the 19 students, two of them actually managed to get jobs in the Pollution Control Board. 
uh, in the city using you know, some of the language uh, that we were uh, um, not telling them about you know, what is air quality, why, are, why do we need information on fuel efficiency, why do we need information on the in-use vehicle fleets, how does transport play a big role in you know, emissions management, not only for the city, but also for um, other purposes as well. Uh, and an important uh, policy message that came out of the survey is something like this, uh, relevant for both the air quality community and for the climate change community. So at that time, there was a huge discussion on, shall we ban all the old vehicles in the city, which are older than 10, 10 years for diesel and older than 15 years for petrol? So is that going to have an immediate effect on, on air quality and an overall you know, fleet management uh, in terms of uh, fuel efficiency and things like that? So a simple survey done over 10 days uh, gave us this graph. And, be, and it's a very clear message that you know, the older vehicles, the percentage of older vehicles is really, really small. Uh, and this is in-use fleet. You know, these are the vehicles that are coming to the petrol stations to fill petrol. Because we were doing a survey for over for one week at each of the stations, so we, by the you know, third or fourth day, you know, the vehicle comes back and the guy will be like, Oh, I already gave you this information like three days ago. So we we were literally looking at an in-use fleet. And this percentage shows that we don't have that many older vehicles in the system to waste our money in going after that kind of policy. Now, if we want a, a, a better fleet, better fuel efficiency, and uh, a better air quality or lower contributions from the transport sector in the city, maybe, maybe we're better off just tightening the standards. Uh, and the newer fleet automatically has better standards, and then we'll have a better fuel efficiency and a better emission factor for the entire fleet. So it that was the discussion that we wanted to drive through this, uh, um, through this uh, graph. And by 2020, it, it just so happened that the Supreme Court actually came down and said that, no, we're nothing doing. Uh, we won't go to uh, Euro 5 anymore. We should just leapfrog from current Euro 4 to Euro 6. So that changed the entire discussion. So the new fleet came in, so it actually made a huge difference. But the, the point being, if we are able to generate information in a simple form, present it in a form that the policymakers also understand, we can actually drive uh, some of these discussions in a, which, in a much simpler, faster, and, and a clear way. Uh, not every city that we work with has a story like this, but we do basically build a lot of these information databases for the cities, and then we put them out there so that um, somebody or the other will start uh, using them. So the current program that we have is the supporting the National Clean Air Program, which has 131 non-attainment cities. So for every city, we are building this information database, and then we'll be putting it online. And where possible, we will personally actually go and uh, do some uh, show and tell as well. By virtue of being in India, we do a lot of work in India, but we're also working in a similar fashion, building stories for uh, in the other regions as well. So over the course of the presentation, I'll give you some uh, examples of what we saw in, in some of these cities. Um, and if anybody is uh, in the audience from any of the cities and want to know more, we can always connect um, or email. So a lot of work that we do is on air quality, which has an immediate impact, uh, um, both in terms of numbers that we can see, uh, and also because it's a regulatory, I mean, it has a very strong regulatory framework um, across the globe. So we have a lot of uh, back and forth with the policy community as well. But at the same time, we have the climate change, which is a long-term effect of the same sources. So we are dealing with the same sources uh, both for air quality and climate change. One has a very immediate story and one has a very long-term story. So this is what, at least in, in our community, uh, it's called as a combined benefits, the co-benefits. So if you do something for air quality, it will eventually have some benefit on climate change. If you do something for climate change, it will also have a trickle-down effect for, for air quality. So something that we, um, it's a, the co-existing uh, 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 collaboration between the two. But uh, the, the important point between both of them, whether you're talking about air quality or climate change, is the fact that this simple mathematical equation. So in terms of, uh, for air quality, pollution is basically emissions divided by 
you know, volume of air that you're dealing with. If you're dealing with city, it's a volume of city. And if you're dealing with a big region, it's the volume of the region. But important thing is that numerator, the mass of emissions. If we want to reduce pollution, we have to reduce emissions because the volume of air is not going anywhere. I mean, we, and we can't really re rely on meteorology to help us in any way to either reduce pollution, whether it's air quality or reduce overall CO2 concentrations. As long as combustion is happening, as long as those emissions are being put into the atmosphere, we will have pollution and then we will have uh, a buildup of CO2 and other greenhouse gases and then when that chain continues. So when this is a simple message that we keep pushing it down every city saying that no, we want policy measures which will reduce emissions at the sources. And so it doesn't have to be transport or residential or industries uh, or even as simple like dust on the roads. Like we need everything, every one of the fuels where the, it is under combustion, we have to reduce that uh, amount, that uh, intensity of that. Now, a good example is what happened during the COVID times. This is uh, one example from uh, Delhi. Uh, we had very strong uh, lockdown for two months in March, April in 2020. And the drop in the satellite measurements was immediate. Now, this is uh, especially for uh, air quality related uh, pollutants. So the first uh, uh, plot on the left-hand side, that's MODIS uh, AOD, that's a NASA satellite. Uh, AOD stands for aerosol optical depth. It's a proxy for particulate matter. And the drop there was significant. The 50% drop in the columnar, you know, the, the, all the air about Delhi. Uh, and that is coming from drop in all the emissions. As soon as the emissions were gone, you know, it, it, everything just cleared up. No, it made a huge difference. So we use this as an example for saying that if we want to clear sky, if we want clear skies, we want to drop air quality, air pollution levels, and want better air quality, we have to target emissions. And this is a really good example. Um, I mean, I'm not advocating lockdowns, but <laughs> this is a good example that uh, that really demonstrates that concept that we have to have zero emissions uh, in order to have you know, better air quality. So coming back to that core benefits concept, that uh, whatever we do for the air quality, it has a trickle-down effect on climate change as well. And there are two important pollutants. They're part of this new acronym called SLCP, short-lived climate precursors. They have a, a strong and immediate uh, influence on radiative forcing. So one is the black carbon, which has a lifetime of days. And then the other one is the tropospheric ozone. So this is not the ozone, which is in the stratosphere, which helps us with the UV, but this is the ozone uh, at our breathing level and under the uh, mixing, mixing layer. Uh, and it has a, a lifetime of about weeks. So, which means that there will be an immediate impact in the radiative forcing if we target enough in reducing black carbon and ozone. So, where do you know, black carbon and ozone come into the picture when we're talking about air quality? I mean, this kind of demonstrates that. So black carbon is a direct emission from combustion. So for example, if you burn, if you have a city or a region which is being driven uh, or you know, combust, uh, burning a lot of diesel, they will have a lot of black carbon. It's a, it's a big component of that. And the ozone comes into the picture on the right-hand side. It helps in converting some of the other gases into particulate form. Uh, so it, it is a big component in converting nitrogen oxides to particulate form, its particulate form, nitrates, and also for sulfur dioxide to sulfates, and then from volatile organic compounds into what we call a secondary organic aerosols. So all of these are part of particulate matter, and they are uh, affecting us, uh, affecting our health directly. But these two precursors, black carbon and ozone, they also help us in the in the in the in the climate change fight as well. At the same time, so a quick recap on uh, the climate change. I'm pretty sure you will see probably see some of these slides from other members also. So I won't spend way too much time. Uh, CO2 numbers are you know, rising. They've they've been rising forever. So the current levels are about 430 uh, ppm. 
there are some new studies that are coming in, uh, looking at especially the anomalies for 2023. They've been very, very strong. The ice levels in Antarctica are, are you know, historically low. The warming temperatures in the northern temp northern hemisphere are also historically very high. Um, and then the anomalies have also been, everything is historically high. So basically, uh, what, what we're seeing is, I think by end of 2023, in 2023 will basically be on top of every, every chart uh, that we can think of. Uh, this is the report that was released by UNEP uh, a week ago. Um, and because they do the emission gaps report every year, this is the latest one. Uh, the total CO2 emissions, they're going up um, um, every year. I think that the only dip that we have in 2020 is because of those lockdowns. Um, and again, I mean, one could use that as an example saying, see, if we cut down activity, if we cut down combustion, there is a drop in the emissions, uh, but no, not the ideal way to, to achieve that, uh, that gap. So also from the same report, the current uh, projections for the anomalies is looking at about 2.9 degrees. Uh, but uh, ideally, we want to be in that 1.5 degree centigrade range, uh, which means that a lot of work has to happen to basically to, to get down to that level. And for all practical purposes, I think we are not on that path. I mean, we are on a path to about that mid-blue range, about 2 degree centigrade range. Um, but I mean, let's be optimistic and, and hope for the best and we go down much more. Uh, we have similar stories on the air quality side as well. Uh, a, a lot of uh, data is available. This is the combination of uh, a lot of modeling work that happens in collating information from all these sectors, very similar to the, the, the CO2 story, um, and building uh, what we call as reanalysis, combining with some satellite observations and build a story for, for the entire globe. Um, generally speaking, uh, when we do have, these are the big polluted regions. You have China, India, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and these regions are growing. Latin America is also uh, has been looking at a very increasing trend. Uh, this is for particulate matter only, PM two point five concentrations, and and but there is also a new report that came out from the same group, uh, looking at what kind of changes are we seeing even on a regional basis. I mean, is there a drop in the even on in the air quality indicators as well? So the biggest drop that we have seen is from China, and the drop is significantly large, uh, so much so that you know, the global average actually has come down uh, for 2020, 2021, because of uh, a lot of interventions that were introduced in China. Um, and to sum up, all those interventions are directly towards reducing the emissions at the sources. I mean, it's not about managing the emissions after they are out in the in the in the atmosphere, but directly at the sources. Maybe I'll, I'll go through some of those examples. Uh, but all the other regions are seeing a big change. Um, for example, India, Middle East, and most of the uh, Eastern Africa, they are looking at an increase of two micrograms per meter cube of PM two point five annually. I mean, that's a large increase. Uh, especially, I mean, it has imp huge implications for health impacts. Um, again, the the health threats are very high, uh, even for, for for air quality. So you have the usual big risks, diet and dietary risks. You have blood pressure, tobacco use, and um, diabetes. Those are big ones, but you're number five globally. Uh, air pollution is there as your biggest health risk, and uh, even the, the kind of health impacts which are being linked. Uh, again, these are also being linked in combination to changes in air, in climate change as well. So it's not just directly because of air quality, but uh, a combination of both air quality and climate change. So earlier, a lot of these risks that were associated with air quality were linked to lungs only in the beginning on the asthma, pneumonia, those kind of things. But now more and more studies are coming out and linking uh, a lot more uh, and endpoints, health endpoints, uh, and it's basically increasing I mean, the, the putting that health risk for air quality and climate change on a much higher pedestal than you know, what we already know or, you know, from the previous studies. Uh, in case of India, uh, very similar. Uh, uh, this is also from the same um, uh, report. 
uh, for India at least, the number of total uh, emission shares have uh, doubled uh, historically compared to the current estimate. Uh, for other regions, it has, has reduced a little bit. I think US almost dropped half, China almost increased two and a half times. Uh, Europe also dropped uh, about 50% uh, uh, overall. So there are trends, both some are increasing, some are decreasing. Developing countries' uh, overall shares are increasing. Uh, but you know, we just hope that you know, these trends will actually be different in the coming years. Uh, on the air quality side, uh, very similar. Compared to the 1990s and 2020, the um, overall pollution levels have almost doubled. Uh, across the region. There's a 100% increase in, in South Asia, uh, about a 60% increase in the North India. Uh, even at the state-by-state -state levels, you know, the numbers are very high. Uh, most important thing uh, that I would like to show in this uh, animation, I mean, you can see the full animation. I'll, I'll post the presentation afterwards so you can see that. Uh, so this is the graph that I want you to focus on. Um, so the even compared to the national standards, which is basically these green colors, uh, this is a 40 micrograms per meter cube is our national guideline. So that was about 60% population was complying or living in the areas with compliance that has dropped to 30%. So that's a huge change. And we had areas, we had no areas with severe air quality in the 1990s. Now we have about 20% of the areas across the board which are not, uh, I mean, they are in the severe air quality range. Um, again, this is an air quality range defined by the Indian guidelines. If you go with the WHO guidelines, these are you know, emergency levels, like 20% more, 20 times more than the WHO uh, guidelines. So the, there is a, a big risk to health. Uh, the overall increase in the, in the, in the COPD, the, you know, um, pulmonary diseases, it's actually increased about 11% over the years. Um, and this is a study from University of Chicago. We basically said that the life expectancy has dropped uh, by 5.2 years um, across India. So region by region, these numbers are very different. Uh, for us, uh, for the current discussion, important plot is this. Where are these emissions coming from and how are they contributing? So the stories that I'm going to show are mostly driven from these. So if if we target each of these sectors, whether it's for the air quality or climate change, what kind of changes can we expect for various policies? And how do we you know, uh, generate interest in, uh, in, in not just from the research community, but also from the policy community to take notice of that? Um, this is something that I will uh, uh, come back to a couple of times in the next round of presentations as well. Uh, it's not about just reducing the uh, intensity or increasing the efficiency of the fuel use. So for example, if a place is using 100 tons of coal, and if we increase the efficiency and if they're still using 100 tons of coal, that probably has no impact on climate change because the same amount of coal is still being used at a, but at a higher efficiency. But if we can avoid using even part of that coal, from 100 tons to say it goes down to 80 tons or 60 tons and replaced with renewables, then you will have a big change both in your air quality and climate change. So it's not about just uh, improving the standards or improving the efficiency levels, but we also have to find ways to even replacing the combustion of these fuels. So uh, um, some of the examples that I'm going to come back to is going to be focusing on that. Like how do we avoid combustion and we still be able to uh, explore the benefits of uh, some of these. But it entirely depends on um, how do we sell this. So it's, this is what we focus on quite a bit. So we have a tool called Simair. It's called Simple Interactive Models for Better Air Quality. I won't go through the I won't go through the entire tool, but I want to I want to quickly demonstrate and how we have used it effectively with policymakers in you know, in getting their interest in uh, in some of these discussions. So let's say that we have uh, a inventory of uh, of a particulate matter SO2 NOx. And, and CO2 as well, because all the sources are the same in a city. This is a dummy city. It has a spatial distribution of five by five grids. 
sorry to interrupt but any chance you could zoom in a little bit if yeah. that is available at all yeah. yes perfect thank you so much yeah, yeah. so we have the these uh, emissions we have accounted for these and let's say we want to target reductions of about 20% of the particulate matter and we are not looking at the other pollutants at all as targets but uh, they are there in the accounting process. We have a laundry list of activities. You now things like you now we want to convert buses from diesel to CNG, or we want to promote public transportation, or inspection and maintenance for cars, uh, for domestic sector promoting LPG and things like that. So these are all dummy numbers, but uh, with some uh, vetting has been done in putting putting them here. So we can Excel has this fantastic future of uh, solver. So you can have some solving functions and say that, okay, I want a least cost option and I want to reach these targets of 20% of particulate matter. So what do I need to do? So it basically says if you can spend about $109 million, you can do these things. Most importantly, this thing is saying that because we're targeting particulate matter, dust is a big component. So if you do paved road dust cleaning, about 70% of the roads, uh, you will be able to achieve a lot of these targets. But most important is these three numbers. No? SO2 is also down by 7%. NOx is also down by 5%. CO2 is down by 14%. We did not target CO2 in any of these interventions. Our primary target was PM. And these are what we call as co-benefits. So you can go back and say that, okay, I'm not interested in uh, CO2 in, in PM10 or PM2.5, but I'm only interested in CO2. I want to reduce 30% of this CO2 in my city, and I still have the same laundry list. Now, what can I do? So this one is going to obviously spit out, uh, it took some extra time. It says, okay, if you spend a you know, similar amount of money and do this instead, you know, coal to LPG, kerosene to LPG, wood to LPG, uh, focus a little bit on inspection and maintenance of cars. Basically, this is targeting improving the fuel efficiency of the vehicles. All least cost options. Now you will be able to reach your thirty percent target, but at the same time, these are your co-benefits. So, depending on the audience uh, that we have, I mean, if you're uh, we, if the policymakers are very much interested in CO two only then we basically target these this calculator towards them and use this co-benefits concept saying, okay, even though you are only interested in CO2, but look, I mean, we can also help the air quality community. And if you're going the other way around, we talking to air quality community, they have their own targets, but they will have co-benefits on CO2 as well. I mean, it's a simple Excel-based tool. It's free. We have some instruction manual on the website and it has been very effective for us in spreading this message of co-benefits uh, and, and trying to make sure that you know, everybody understands that even though we are focusing on air quality, even though we are focusing only on carbon dioxide, I mean, we can benefit a lot of other, uh, other uh, groups as well. So I'll quickly, uh, in the remaining uh, 15 minutes, go through some of the stories that I have on how these co-benefits concept has been used and uh, um, are not used in some of the cases. <laughs> so uh, Delhi kind of shows up a, couple, a few times more than the other cities. So this is the CNG conversion that happened in the late 90s uh, because Supreme Court mandated saying that, okay, we don't want any more diesel buses in the city. Let's just convert all of them to CNG. Uh, so if we focused on that uh, ruling only and the work that was done at that time, so the CO2 benefits are very, very minimal because the carbon content in diesel and the carbon content in CNG, no, they're fairly the same. No, you, you won't be able to make a huge difference in that. But from air quality perspective, the drops were immediate and there was a lot of change uh, uh, locally, uh, both in, term, in terms of air quality, comfort, uh, a lot of uh, social uh, stories were also built around that time. But at the, but at the same time, there was also uh, this the uh, this stories around efficiency. The vehicles themselves become more efficient. Means that this, for the same 100 kilometers, the vehicles were using less amount of fuel. So earlier they were using 12, uh, 12 liters of diesel, 
they are not using 12 liters of uh, equivalent of CNG, but they're using like five kilos of CNG. So the drops for CO2 came because the efficiency of the vehicle operations has gone up. Uh, so in a way, you're actually replacing an, an a, a inefficient equipment with a efficient equipment. So for air quality, the difference was in the, uh, the pollutant content itself, but for CO2, it was not the pollutant content, but it was the replacement of old to new and improving the efficiencies of that. So there's a story around that. Uh, for the the very new age uh, is uh, the EVs. Uh, it's, there's a lot, a lot of push for the EVs in the, in the cities these days. And Delhi is actually trying to make sure that uh, the 25% of the new sales are going to be EVs. Uh, it's a mixed bag. There are a lot of reports on this. Uh, especially looking at life cycle assessments, whether uh, EVs actually help in the climate change or not. There are reports basically say that uh, a diesel vehicle over a lifetime is, and an EV vehicle over a lifetime, the CO2 levels are very similar, but there are also, uh, it's main, mainly driven by the fact that the electricity that are using for EVs um, is going to be the, the big changer. Now, if the electricity is still coming from coal, uh, or you no know, fuel oil burning, then the change is going to be over a lifetime, not as immediate, not as uh, as much as we want it to be. But if we shift that electricity production to renewable energy and then use that to feed into the cars, you will have a big drop in uh, your overall CO2 footprint and. EVs being EVs, there is no combustion in this vehicle. There's no petrol, diesel, or CNG being burnt. So you will have a very immediate impact on air quality. You know, that's a, a huge given fact. So here, the battle now is, one is to push for EVs from the air quality perspective, but we want to have CO2 benefits also. Then we have to also start working with the uh, power community as well to get more renewables into the picture. Um, there was a, a big experiment of this happened um, in regulating the number of vehicles on the road. Um, I mean, we I mean, we we started using this example for a couple of things. We do want lesser number of vehicles on the road uh, that will actually help in a lot of ways. Obviously, no, no petrol or diesel combustion happening on the road, so air quality will improve. But in in at least in this case, in 2015, 2016, when this was tested in Delhi. Uh, mixed results. Now, people actually found loopholes uh, in uh, in getting out of the house at a, at a before the regulations came into play, and then going from leaving the office after the regulations went into play. So, if we started looking from hourly basis, the there was some change, and for a positive change. But if we started looking on a day to day basis, the change was not so much because people found over a day people found loopholes but the, the biggest thing was the speeds the vehicle speeds increased across the city there was almost a 15 to 20 percent increase in the vehicle speeds which means that the engines are running at the speed that they are designed to uh, operate optimally so it automatically increases the efficiency of the vehicles so the same argument as uh, um, what I mentioned in the CNG case. So if you have a vehicle which is not using, not 12 liters, but it's using only 10 liters for the same amount of distance, you are actually reducing the carbon footprint of the city. So automatically it will have immediate benefits on the air quality as well. So from this, the same experiment, from the air quality perspective, there were a lot of question marks, but from a CO2 perspective, it was actually a, a, a big win because we increased the, vehicle speeds, we increased the efficiency of these engines. So we automatically had a, a big drop on in the, in the overall CO2 footprint. Um, in Beijing, this is the only place where we have a very successful application of this RD1 experiment. Uh, this was during the Olympic Games in, in 2008. Uh, they also controlled 50% of the vehicles using the same RD1 experiment, but they did not have any exceptions whether it was official thing or driven by women or it was the vehicle was on running on gas instead of petrol or diesel, no exceptions. Purely vehicle number was used. So if you have an odd day, 
only odd vehicles, even day, you know, only even uh, even vehicles. So even then, uh, this is a satellite image from MODIS, same uh, satellite that I showed earlier. In the columnar numbers over Beijing, there was a 50% drop uh, during that the month of Olympic Games. And NOx is a direct linkage to transport emissions. And basically, we can use that as a proxy saying that no, this intervention had a very direct impact. This is the only place where the impact has been um, documented so well. Uh, Mexico City also tried to do this, but uh, people then immediately bought secondhand vehicles uh, with a different number plate. And no, it was <laughs> entirely, uh, they had to scrape the entire program really fast. Uh, that didn't really work. Um, I think this is one last example from Delhi. This is the, again, uh, pushing public transportation. It has a huge impact on uh, carbon footprint in the city and for air quality as well. But the, the pilot uh, in Delhi was only for six kilometers. It didn't go so well, it was dismantled. But at the same time in 2010, uh, when the Commonwealth Games were, were introduced, this bus lanes were drawn for 80 kilometers. No special construction was done, but using those orange cones across the city for 80 kilometers to, to, you know, to transport athletes and um, uh, officials across the stadiums, from the venues everywhere. And it was a very successful program because it was enforced really well. And during that time, it actually made a difference in air quality. I mean, we actually had a mobile unit. We went around and uh, took notice of that. So if we increase like this, the operations of public transportation, it has a huge impact on, on both on air quality and the city's carbon print as well. So these are really two successful experiments not experiments, um, programs implemented in, in Bogota, Colombia. Bogota, Colombia is the first, I think, successful program, Transmillennia. Trans -mill <laughs> um, and it, it's really uh, a great example that you know, if you want to see how public transportation can help in uh, reducing cities' carbon footprint, these are really two good case studies that you should go after. Um, and in Guangzhou, for example, now they have also started to introduce a lot of EV vehicles. The largest uh, fleet in the world is now uh, running here. Um, so you should be able to have a, a good stories from uh, even from CO2 perspective. Uh, Metro has been a big boom, but not for air quality in general, uh, because uh, when we did the surveys on who's actually taking the Metro at the moment, uh, it is mostly people who are already are previously doing cycle or, or motorcycles a little bit and uh, people who are already on the bus, they are the ones taking the train. So uh, from that perspective, uh, we didn't see a big change yet, but when I mean, that is changing with the number of stations increasing and the number of operations increasing, so, uh, it's, um, so we have to wait and see. Uh, the freight management, it's a huge thing. So how, how does the freight move across the city? So if uh, a lot of trucks are still passing through a city, uh, then you will have a very large footprint. So this was the case before in case of Delhi, but after the introduction of both the expressways on the eastern side and the, and, and the western side, almost 85% of the traffic is now going on the ring roads, outer ring roads, and not going through the city. So it automatically had an effect on both local air quality and also city's uh, uh, carbon footprint. Um, this is a great example uh, uh, from London uh, using economic measures. Uh, not, uh, not always successful everywhere. Uh, there is a reason for that. I'll, I'll come to it after two more examples on this. Um, it makes a huge difference. Again, it, it goes back to not having cars on the road. It's as simple as that. Or you you make this um, the, the economic measure so stringent that only those with really good vehicles are entering that zone and they are still paying something but not as much as the as the other other vehicles um even before london singapore was the first one to introduce very successful um has almost 30 years of operations so we actually have a, a good working paper on this topic that uh, you should definitely take a look at 
Uh, again, and Stockholm has also been super effective in uh, using congestion pricing as a great tool, both for air quality and also for city's carbon footprint. So all three of them were successful, mainly because cities actually provide alternatives. So if so, I, I don't really have to own a vehicle in Singapore to go around. So I can I don't have to own a vehicle. No, I can take the public transportation from any point A to point B, and be be content. And I don't have to I don't waste any time. I don't lose any time, and I, I get around very easily. So it, it is possible to do it in all three cities. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of developing countries are not able to replicate the same. Uh, at the same level. A lot of cities have done case studies saying pilots, saying, oh, can we introduce uh, more of this toll book kind of scenario, but not so successful. Only because city needs to have a good alternative system, whether it's a bus service or a metro system that can handle the shift that's going to happen from motorized transport to non-motorized transport in this case. Uh, um, quickly on the power sector, this is a uh, work that we did a uh, long time back, trying to address the standards. Um, this is uh, briefly mentioned earlier. Changing the standards can help you uh, in getting a better air quality. But if we really want to change the footprint of the industry itself, we really have to go for a, a shift in the production itself. So in this case, you know, we need to have more and more renewables into the picture. Coal is not going anywhere, but if we can replace the amount of coal that is there in the system to renewables, uh, amount of electricity generated to renewables, I think there will be a huge change. Uh, so this is a huge lobby. Uh, we are still fighting to, to, to make this a good success. Um, uh, last few couple of more case studies and then I can get the timer as well. These are the what we call as brick kilns, the dirtiest sources they are everywhere. I mean, this is in Punjab in India. This is uh, Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan is even, even worse. They're much larger and uh, uh, they're almost double the size of what we find in South Asia and, uh, and use coal 100%. And, and they don't have a chimney, so their the combustion levels are combustion efficiencies are really really low, and we find this uh, across Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa. All the designs actually are exported from India, so I mean, we we hold some of those things. But a new um, system that's being pushed through these brick kilns is called as new vertical shaft brick kiln, where the efficiencies are almost fifty percent, but the the adaption to this technology has been very, very slow. Very few countries have started doing this. This is a Dhaka, Bangladesh. They have successfully you know, converted about 50% of the uh, kilns uh, into this um, um, vertical shaft kilns. And it basically reduces both the carbon footprint and has a huge benefit for air quality. Um, uh, heating has been a huge uh, uh, sector uh, which is uh, hard to account for also because it has a direct linkage to meteorology. And that is something that you can say that it has a direct linkage to climate change. If you are seeing more and more uh, te lower temperatures in the northern latitudes, we're going to have more, more need for, uh, for the energy. Uh, the current uh, Russia-Ukraine war really didn't help. Uh, Germany, there were days when entire power generation was renewables. 100%, but now they are now opening uh, some of the coal power plants to support some of the winter demand. Um, this is uh, the northernmost big city, Ulaanbaatar. Uh, a, a lot of heating is in situ, and a lot of heating has to happen within uh, the house, what they call as GERS. So this was something that I was personally involved in, so I'm very proud of it. Uh, so a very simple change in the stove that is used inside these houses. So you increase the surface of these stoves, these fins that you see on the sides of it, and it basically improved 30% of the fuel efficiency. So it's a, I mean, the concept is you increase the surface for more radiation from the stove. I mean, this is a cast iron stove uh, and very sturdy. I mean, the temperatures are down to like minus 40, minus 15 in these areas. So you need to have a very uh, sturdy stove. But 
that simple change it really actually increased the efficiency and um, both air quality and climate and the CO2 footprint in these areas. Uh, Delhi, again, it's a huge uh, um, case, uh, need for heating, but something that's not really addressed in any of the action plans. Um, a, a last one, this is something uh, really doesn't get accounted for, is open fires, biomass fires. So in, in, uh, in the climate change and CO2 accounting, any of the biomass fires, they actually get a zero number by default because it says it's a renewable source, so you don't really have any emissions from it. But it has a huge impact on, on air quality. So in case of uh, Kampala, Uganda, this is lot, uh, some of the modeling work that we've done. We were able to account for a lot of contribution that's happening in the city for, a lot, for, the, the, for most of the 10 months. But for January and February, it was a, a big doozy. I mean, we, we had to go through multiple rounds to, to find out that the contribution is actually coming from the fires that are happening you know, three, about 300 kilometers north of the city. And I mean, this is something, I mean, this is a story we can only drive from air quality, no, not from a CO2 perspective, uh, but it's there. So this is something we have to keep addressing uh, a lot of these. So overall, both from air quality perspective or from climate change perspective, uh, there are a lot of options exist. Uh, personally, what we find is if we can put together stories with information that whether it's already available or you do a lot of the calculations and then uh, put a story together, it can help in addressing the uh, each of the sector, each of these sector by sector, or you know you can use the co-benefits concept and and start selling it uh, to, to both the parties. And it has been really effective. And so for us, having information and making that open has been the biggest uh, benefit. And this is something we'll keep pushing in other cities as well. So one thing that we really don't want to push are these, uh, what we call as smoke towers, and it's become very popular in India, uh, basically giant vacuum cleaners trying to suck up pollution. I think this is the same is happening in CO2 as well in the carbon capture programs. I mean, they really don't help on a mass scale. I mean, if we really want change on a mass scale, we really have to address emissions at the sources and not when this pollution is already in the atmosphere. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was great. So much detail. Uh, that was really brilliant. Uh, I know we have uh, very uh, little time left, so I'm going to jump straight into some questions uh, that have come in from the audience. Um, first one being, uh, are there any good toolkits, easy for the average person uh, to measure local air quality, gather data, feed it in somewhere and make it comparable across the regions? Um, there is. I mean, there's some tools that are available on our website ourselves. Uh, if you go under research tools and and Samir, when we and there are some instructional videos also to use uh, what I just demonstrated. And if uh, the if the idea is to uh, use monitoring data, then the tools are a little bit different. Those are also available. Uh, best is just send us an email, and we can put you in touch with that. Okay. All right. Um, next question being a little bit on the policy side with city authorities. So how do you engage with cities or authorities to start developing local solutions? Like what strategies have you found successful? Generally for us, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, one thing that really, really helped is making information uh, open. So when we build an emissions inventory for a city, let's like city like Patna, for example, we don't wait for them to ask us to build the inventory. We are building the inventory and we dump it into the public domain and we send them copies saying, okay, we have done this. You no, know, uh, Here's a copy, please take a look. And most often, believe it or not, in a year or two, they do come back saying that, okay, well, we received your leaflets. Uh, we went to a website, there's a lot of information there. Can we talk? So uh, that, that that worked uh, worked for us everywhere. So don't wait for them to come to you. I mean, they'll come eventually. Uh, it's, it's like a climate change game. It's a long-term game. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, <laughs> for sure. Uh, there's this one question which, you know, is someone just asked this and I feel this as well. And we need to talk about co-benefits. Uh, you know, health is such a major outcome uh, which is uh, impacted by air pollution. Um 
you, you know, it, there is very little being talked about and also in the medical uh, you know, fraternity about the interaction of air quality and disease or mortality uh, or, mor or morbidity. Um, any, any examples you've seen of you've been able to bridge that gap um, using the co-benefits model? Um, yes and no, uh, it, but it depends on the region though. I mean, in India, uh, for example, fight is uh, still an ongoing thing because it's hard to get access to records. Uh, uh, very few hospitals actually open up those records. And uh, Ames, for example, in Delhi and their campuses, they have good records and then we are able to use that. But that's only, I think, a, a minuscule of the, uh, the overall uh, cases that we actually uh, get uh, reported or unreported at the same time. Uh, but if you go to the other regions, uh, especially in Europe and US, that's a very different story. So we are able to build the story uh, at much, much uh, at deeper levels. Uh, same thing is happening in China as well. China, uh, especially the a lot of cohort studies, a lot of epidemiological studies uh, have been going on for about 10 years and producing a lot of information. So all the new global burden of disease studies, uh, analysis that's happening, some of the graphs that I showed in the presentation, they, they were using earlier US and US-centric work US and EU centric work, but in the last few years, that has really changed. Now they started including a lot of China work and Southeast Asia work and South Asia work uh, is coming in. So maybe in the next couple of years, there will be a, a good database coming in that will feed that uh, pool. All right, thank you. Um, there's this uh, question about, you know, how cleaning up the air, reducing pollution and cleaning up the air in some sense, uh, could have a negative impact on warming and it, it could actually yeah. warm us even further. Mm -hmm. uh, any insights on that? Is that real? How much of, of a factor is that? Uh, so it happens. So that's why uh, that the new buzz that SLCP, the short-lived climate precursors, that is highly coming in. So because these pollutants, if reduced, they will have much faster and immediate impact on radiative forcing. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why, uh, from a air, uh, from a the air quality community perspective, we push for you know, we try to reduce the black carbon and ozone that will have air quality impacts immediately, both for health and in general local environment. But immediately, you will have some radiative impacts on the climate change as well. Okay, uh, I'm going to actually take a risk and ask you a question about Delhi, which somebody has asked, because I know we can talk for hours about <laughs> air pollution. Uh, but there's this uh, thing that happens every winter where Delhi is enveloped in smog uh, and lots of mm. pollution. And, you know, we talk about various possible sources, some blame it on uh, stubble, crop stubble burning, mm. vehicle pollution, industrial pollution, brick kills, like there's so many things talked about. And on the policy side, nothing much seems to change. Mm -hmm. uh, anything from your personal experience, which you know, you can sure get give us some more insight on that. Uh, no, I mean, I'm I'm as uh, uh, I'm optimistic, but uh, a lot of work still needs to be done when it comes to Delhi. Uh, we know a lot of information on where is the pollution coming from, but the action on the ground has been really, really minimum. Uh, it's always been uh, media pushing. Uh, pointing fingers or helping the other policymakers to point fingers to the north uh, when I mean, a lot of activity actually happens you know, both within the boundaries and in the immediate vicinity of the city boundaries. Uh, so, I mean, we really are trying to make that a uh, awareness campaign on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just, I'm going to squeeze one last question and I know we're out of time, but there's this question on, uh, is there a role for the private sector and innovation uh, in, in all of this? Uh, what's your experience there? Yeah, I mean, for example, the, most of the EV drive is from private sector only. Uh, I mean, the public sector, the public bodies are giving provisions, but uh, a lot of the change that's happening is from the private sector, whether pushing for the vehicles themselves or uh, even household EVs um, that's actually coming from the private sector. So, All right. Okay, uh, folks, we're out of time, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, firstly, uh, Sarat, thank you. Uh, firstly, of course, for yeah. all of your work, it's <laughs> really showing us a part of you know what is necessary, what is possible. Uh, and also for coming in today and speaking uh, with all of us here. 
for explaining so many really complex concepts to us in such elegant uh, language. Uh, and there's a couple of things that are going to stay with me for a while and I'm going to think about. One is this notion <laughs> of focusing on co-benefits. Uh, and yeah. I've talked about this before, but you, you brought it to the fore. And also the point about stories, right? I mean, it's, stories are so important. Uh, they, they govern our life. They drive everything that we do. Um, so absolutely, thanks a lot for that. And also the audience. I mean, thank you for being here today for your amazing questions. I could see tons of engagement on the chat, people asking questions, answering them, all of that. So I'd uh, love to see all of that there. Um, thanks everyone for coming and hope to see everyone at more events like this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye. -bye.